you need to be fed. You know, you need to go to church and hear homilies. You need to listen to CDs. You need to, you know, to have Christian brothers and sisters who, who feed you, who teach you, who, 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 who uh, nourish you spiritually. But then you should get to a point where you yourself learn to feed yourself. You learn to have the disciplines of, of reading the Bible, of listening to God's Word in your heart, of finding other good spiritual books. You learn the good resources. You learn to feed yourself. I hope most of you are there. You know where to get the good stuff. You know the good books. You read your Bible. You can feed yourself. But that's not the end. The end is that we should be feeding others. And so often... We, we, don't, we don't get that far. We get as far as, as, you know, being fed and maybe feeding ourselves a bit, but we're scared to take that extra step of feeding others. You know, it's kind of like the person who says, you know, I encountered the Lord 40 years ago in a Bible study. And I've been going to that Bible study for 40 years. The same five ladies, we've been getting together for 40 years, you know. And it's like, dude, you got to... You know, you, you got to do something with that. They say the only way to keep your faith is to give it away, you know. Some people wonder, why isn't our prayer group growing? You know, well, invite people, you know. It's kind of like people, you know, who, and we experience this in the charismatic renewal. Some people, they've had their upper room Pentecost experience. Remember the, the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit ca came down, they were filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't stay in the upper room. They went out into the streets and into the whole world. And I think, you know, if you find a, I got to watch what I say here, but if you find a charismatic prayer group that's been meeting for 30 years with the same people, they're stuck in the upper room. They got to get out. You know, they got to get out and, and, and preach the gospel. And same thing with the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Lord pouring out just the manifestations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the healing. And we talk to anyone who has experience doing evangelization work, doing, you know, uh, work in, in the charismatic renewal, and they'll all say that the Holy Spirit is poured out most powerfully and in a most manifest way, you know, where you get the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in situations of evangelization. And I've done a little traveling around myself too, and I've experienced the same thing. Like if I'm invited to speak to a prayer group that's been the same 30 people praying together for the last 30 years, and we pray for the Holy Spirit, not much happens. I mean, there's always the one person who right away falls down, you know, but I don't, I'm not sure how real that is, you know. But if you go into a prison or into, uh, you know, a youth group that has some new kids who've never heard the gospel, and you preach the gospel, and you pray for the Holy Spirit to come, wow, power, you know, uh, manifestations. Or if you go to countries where the charismatic renewal is just beginning, and this is the first time they hear about this grace of a new Pentecost in our church today that the popes have been talking about, when they experience that for the first time, wow, Power, signs, wonders. Why? Because we're going out. It's so necessary for us to go out and to bring this to uh, all peoples. It's the same thing, you know, I used to work with university students. I was a university chaplain. And there was lots of Christian groups on the campus, all kinds of them. And there was two types of groups, I would say. There were the clubs, the Christian clubs, and then there were the missionary groups. Some of the Christian groups, they were basically clubs. You know, people would get together and hang out, and they were kind of inwardly focused. Some of them didn't even bother looking up to the sky. They just looked at each other or looked at their belly buttons, you know. And those groups, they didn't grow. They weren't making a change on the campus. Then there were other groups who were very intentional and strategic, who defined themselves as missionary groups. And they were very intentional about meeting people who had never met Christ and bringing them to Christ and teaching them to do the same. And those were the groups that had the life, that were growing, that had an anointing on them. And of course, with my students in the chaplaincy, I kept insisting, this is a missionary group. 
I'd always give them a hard time in the beginning of the year when they would ignore the first-year students. I'd say, listen, if a first-year student comes in, their priority, you, you welcome them, you, you ask them their name, what they're, you know, where they're from and all that, you know, and you have to tell people that. Because our culture, we, you know, we're kind of like sheep, you know, stay together, stay together, ignore people, you know. Some churches can be like that too. You know, you hear people, you know, I went to a church and no one said hi to me, no one acknowledged me, you know, and it's like, what's the point, you know? Are we a missionary group here? Do we have a focus on the lost, on the stray, on the prodigal sons? Is that our number one desire? Now, the best model, I think, for bringing people to Christ, if there was one strategy that I think is the best of all, it's the strategy that the Lord Jesus himself used. Did Jesus put on big conferences? Not exactly. You know, did Jesus have a TV ministry? No. Just a little hello to our people from Food for Life. Good to have you with us today. Uh, nothing against uh, TV ministries. What did Jesus do? He chose 12 people and he spent three years with them. And then he sent them out to do the same. And there are many ministries that follow this exact strategy. So often times as Christians, we get so focused on our big groups and all that type of thing that we forget to invest in new people and people who are far from God. You know, I heard an, an interview, I think I listened to an interview uh, with Billy Graham at the end of his ministry career, and he was asked, like, if you could do it all over again, what would you do? What would you change? And he said, I'd go right back, and I would do what Jesus did. I'd spend less time traveling all around the world, and I'd spend more time. I'd find a group of 12 people. I would spend three years with them. I would eat with them. I would live with them. I would invest everything into them, and then I would send them out to do the exact same thing. We call this spiritual multiplication. Have you heard of that term before? This is how it works. Pretend you were a phenomenal evangelist, the best of the best, so good that every day you converted a hundred people. You brought a hundred people to Christ. If you did that, in four years, you'd have 144,000 people in the Lord. In 10 years, you'd have 360,000 people in the Lord. In 16 years, you'd have over 500,000 people in the Lord. Now, pretend you took another approach, the Jesus approach. In every six months, you worked with one person. You invested in one person every six months, but you sent that person out to do the same, to invest in people and send them out. In one year, you'd have worked with four people. In five years, you'd have changed the lives of a thousand people. In 10 years, a million people. In 16 and a half years, you'd have reached the whole world. That was Jesus' approach. He invested in 12 men. He sent them out. They established churches. They sent them out. That's how missionary work has, has been done typically throughout the centuries. You know, there was a time where the missionary work was done by monks. They'd set up a monastery with 12 people. People would join the monastery. They'd get a little cramped. So what would they do? They'd build another monastery in another place, 12 people. That monastery would grow, and these monks converted the whole world. Or the whole, you know, the Western world anyways, the Irish monks. And even us, the Companions of the Cross. We started in Ottawa, a bunch of men. And then we were sent out. We built a foundation in Toronto, then in Halifax, then in Houston, Detroit, and so on. And so they say that Jesus' favorite equation is not addition, but multiplication. You know, Jesus focused not just on bringing people to, you know, to a place where they could feed themselves, but would call them to feed others, and that's what's most important. You know, I sometimes I'm amused uh, how some, some of the non-Catholic Christian denominations here, when I meet people from these denominations, they ask, you know, what do you do? I say, I'm a priest. And they say, oh, great, I'm a pastor. 
I said, oh, wonderful. Like, what church do you pastor? Well, I don't have a church. You know, I just took a weekend course and I got my pastor certificate, you know. And I was thinking, my gosh, like every single member of the church is a pastor. I th at first I thought that was silly, but then there was a part of me that thought, wait a minute, they're on to something. I'd rather have a church full of people who think they're pastors than a church full of people who think they just show up on Sunday to receive, you know. Like they're kind of on to something, you know. <clears throat> Anyways, I just want to kind of drive home the reality, brothers and sisters, that this call to the divine commission, the great commission, is a call for each one of us. And if we go through our whole life having neglected this call, we will come before the judgment throne discovering that in many ways we've, we've wasted our whole life. You know, I remember when I was a young teenager before my conversion, the thought of the priesthood seemed like the biggest waste of life possible. Becoming a priest or a nun or anything like that would, would seem to me like the most useless thing a person could ever do with his or her life. And then I had my conversion, and I remember I was studying engineering in my first year, a couple years after my conversion, I was studying computer engineering. And again, before my conversion, I thought being a computer engineer was one of the best things you could do with your life. But during that first year of computer engineering, I found myself in a bit of a crisis because I was reading about the saints and, what, you know, the, the scriptures, and I was thinking to myself, do I really want to spend my whole life helping a high-tech stock go up? And all of a sudden, there was just this reality that to me, and again, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that being an engineer is, is, is a bad thing to do if that's your call. If you're a married man, you got to, you know, feed your family and all that kind of thing. But for me, at this point in my life, becoming an engineer to help a stock go up, to help a company, at the time, the telecommunication was a big deal, getting the internet pumped into every house as fast as possible, the thought of giving my whole life to that seemed like an absolute waste. And so many times in life, we, we, we're like, you know, the rally races where they, have, they follow directions, you know, go one mile, turn left, go two miles, turn right, go 3.2 miles, turn right. And some of these rally races, one person gets off track and another person follows him and everyone gets off track. And the guy in last place looks at the direction and says, wait a minute, this is 1.2 miles and it says 1.5 miles. Goes a little further, wins the race because he didn't follow the crowd. We don't want to spend our whole life racing, you know, climbing the ladder and becoming more successful and more money to lose our family, our friends, our, our children, our, to lose everything and realize, I lost the race. You know, Jesus said, why do you spend energy working for what doesn't satisfy? And so each one of us, we need to look carefully at the map. Am I racing off in the right direction? Is my energy, is my heart, is my zeal being spent in the right direction? Because if not, we don't want to come to the end of the life, our life realizing I was on the wrong path. I lost the race. I want to be able to say, I fought the fight and I ran the race. And I want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in and take your reward.